Listen to Christopher is baiting me in the comments field. Want to see if we're as good as Sarah Cowan. Well, and I would just like to say that I have, I graduated from seminary just more than 10 years ago. So uh, a little bit of rustiness in the old theological knowledge would be understandable as compared to a current graduate student. So hold her to a higher standard than me. Um, she, by the way, is in a car right now heading for Memphis uh, to finish out her internship in person. So she's probably not watching, but maybe in the, um, as she watches the replay, she'll catch that little comment from you, Linda, and uh, from me as well. I'm going to close the door and I'll be right back. Then we'll start. <coughs> Good morning and welcome to the Rector's Bible Study at Church of the Holy Communion in Memphis, Tennessee, being broadcast from my living room, not from the church due to the global pandemic. I'm the Reverend Sandy Webb and we begin our study today in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. For the last two weeks, this class has been led by seminarian Sarah Cowan, who is serving as pastoral intern at Church of the Holy Communion this summer. Thank you for sticking with her and giving good feedback. Uh, one of the great gifts that large congregations can offer to the Episcopal Church is providing opportunities and places for seminarians and new priests to train. There is very little that I enjoy doing more than mentoring new clergy uh, and being able to share Bible study with Sarah for the last few weeks uh, has been wonderful. Um, we have a, a senior and experienced clergy team at Holy Communion right now. Um, Hester started with us as a curate and now has uh, six years of experience. Jonathan came to us with experience and has been here for two years now. And um, it's nice to have a student around uh, as well. So thank you for welcoming Sarah and giving her good feedback. Uh, we may have her back one more time before the summer is out. But I am here and you are here and let us begin. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your word has never been silent. Grant us grace to hear your voice today as we study your word, as we walk through the immediacy of St. Mark's gospel, the gospel that reminds us that the faith we share is urgent. The needs of the world that you love are urgent and the kingdom of God is near at hand. Come and bless us. Inspire us in unexpected ways today and make us your apostles to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin in Mark chapter seven. I want to actually pause before we read. In the, the very first sentence of Mark chapter 7, we see the word Pharisee, Pharisee, and that's a, that's a word that's telling us something. Uh, you'll remember, uh, we always do this, uh, Pharisees, that's not fair, you see, fair, you see, that's the Pharisees, they're the lawyers, the ones who are interested in the technicalities of the law, and the Sadducees, they're just sad, you see, they don't believe in the resurrection. So when we hear the word Pharisee, we want to code in our minds that we're starting to talk to lawyers here. We're starting to talk to people who are interested in the technicalities of the law. And that gives us a sense of where the story is going to be going. Chapter 7 and verse 1. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they have thoroughly washed their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there also are many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? Why do they eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father and mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had is from Korban, that is, an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or a mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on. And you do many things like this. Then he called to the crowd again and said, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. When he had led the crowd and entered when he had left the crowd and entered the house, the disciples asked him about the parable. Then he said, Do you still do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, It is what cometh out of a person that defiles. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile the person. All right, we've got a little bit of a technicality going on here, a technical argument. Jesus is answering the Pharisees, he's answering the lawyers with a legal argument. What constitutes defiling a person? Let's go through the facts first, and then we'll go back into the interpretation. The facts, Jesus, I believe we are in Galilee, if I am not mistaken. Yes, we're in Galilee. And some Pharisees have come up from Jerusalem. So what are they doing there? The Pharisees have come up to Galilee, they've left Jerusalem where they have authority, where they are the leaders of the religious community, where all of their sacred texts are. They've left that behind and they've gone up to the country to uh, where they appear with Jesus. We can assume that they are not there with good intentions. For what reason would they have come all the way to Galilee? It's not as though they had a weekend home on the lake. They've come up to figure out what Jesus is doing. They've come, up, they've come up to cause a problem. They've come up to ask these difficult questions. That's why they're there. So when they come to this meeting of the disciples or this meeting of the community to hear Jesus speak, they're not there seeking inspiration. They're there to look around and make sure that everyone is following the rules. And they find that they're not. Up, 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 up! You're eating and you didn't wash your hands. Now, let's pause there for just one second. Here in the midst of a global pandemic, we all seem to be pointing out to people, did you wash your hands? Did you wash that food? Did you put on your mask? Let's assume for a moment that this is a temporary condition and that back in normal times, we would have been a little bit less intent on who is washing their hands and who is washing their food and who is not. But the Pharisees came up and looked around and they were trying to find some violation of the law that they could use to make their argument. And there it was. Your disciples, Jesus, are not washing their hands. I bet that they're not washing their pots or their kettles at all either. How on earth can you say that your people follow the law when clearly, clearly they don't? Because they're not washing their hands or their dishes nearly well enough. They thought that they had laid down the trump card, the argument that could not be defeated. The law says you have to wash your hands. Jesus doesn't require his people to wash their hands. Therefore, Jesus is in violation of the law. And Jesus' disciples are in violation of the law. And Jesus certainly can't be from God because he's not following the law. Well, Jesus lays into the Pharisees something fierce. And let's remember that St. Mark's gospel is the fast-paced gospel. 
back in chapter one, we had all of the disciples were called. So Jesus had been born, had grown up, had appeared on the scene, had gotten baptized, and had start calling disciples all within the first 20 verses of St. Mark's Gospel. This story goes on 23 verses, so longer than the birth narrative, the introduction, the calling of the disciples, and the baptism. This gets more territory than that, all of those major events. Why does Mark give us that much material? My suspicion is he gives us this material because it's really important to know what Jesus's relationship to the law is. Jesus is a Jew. Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher of the Jewish law. So we need to understand how he feels about the law and what he wants us to feel about the law as well. What Jesus gives us is this image of what really matters. It's not how you wash your hands. It's not what you eat. It's how you love your neighbor. He lays into the Pharisees because they're there obviously to test him, obviously to catch him out, obviously to make a logical argument that doesn't support his mission. He responds to them by saying, look at how many commandments you bend. Look at how many times you have departed from the law. And yet you say you're all righteous and you've come up all this way to catch me out in front of my followers. No, sir. No, sir. We don't play that game. You hypocrites. It makes it entirely clear here why Jesus is calling the Pharisees hypocrites, because they are up there to catch him out for violating the law when they themselves are not holding to all the provisions of the law um, either. Just a little bit of good biblical knowledge. We will, uh, want to sort of tuck into the back of our memories how many commandments there are in the, in the Old Testament, in the law. And the answer by most counts is 613 commandments, 613 commandments, the thou shalt nots of the world. Um, and the easy way to remember 613 commandments is 613, 613 equals 10. 6 plus 1 plus 3 is 10, and we can code in in our brain the 10 commandments. The total number, if you add the digits, comes out to 10. So 613 commandments are what the Pharisees expected Jesus to be fulfilling, and Jesus pointed out that they don't even achieve that themselves. Take a look at the parenthetical notation in chapter 7 and verse 19. Thus Jesus declared all food clean. That's a really big deal for someone who was leading people who were Jews. For Jesus to say, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Worry about the mission. Don't worry about washing your hands. Worry about what I've asked you to do, which is to love people, to love your neighbor, to tell them that the kingdom of God is at hand. Worry about that. And don't worry so much about the food. If someone ever asks you why it is that uh, Christians don't keep the kosher laws around food that our Jewish brothers and sisters do, this is the place that you can answer them from. Jesus is Jewish. We are a descendant of the Jewish faith. We share all of that in common. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we share it. But here, Jesus has told us that it's not so much about what we eat, but about what we do and how we live. And this is the uh, chapter in which he makes that distinction clear. I'm going to pause for just a second to see if any comments pop up in the field. Uh, there's about a 20-second delay between my speaking and your hearing. So I'm going to give us just a moment uh, to see if any uh, questions or comments or feedback want to appear in the field. I almost failed to mention how this um, passage concludes, where Jesus talks about how we can be defiled. The Pharisees had come with this image given to them by the Jewish law that defilement comes from the outside. Defilement comes from what we take into our bodies or put onto our bodies, what food we eat, what practices 
that, that defi we are defiled from outside. Inside we're pure, outside we're defiled. What we take in is going to make us uh, defiled. Jesus turns that on his head and says, it's not what you take in that makes you unclean, it's what you put out. Now, I'm not gonna go into the scatological uh, and bathroom aspects of that, but you can make that assumption for yourself. But what Jesus says, taking that sort of bathroom metaphor is what comes out from us is what defiles us, not what we put in. What comes out from an unclean spirit is, as listed in chapter seven, verse 21 and following, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of this comes from within, Jesus says, and these are the things that defile. Now, Jesus has listed some of my favorite activities in here, but these are the things that Jesus is calling us beyond. Jesus is calling us beyond. And if you look at that, it's a major shift of understanding. Cleanness, sanctification, is no longer related to the practices that we do, to the food that we eat, to the way that we clean ourselves. Our cleanliness before God is determined by what's coming out from our heart. Do we approach the world and our fellows with malice? with wickedness? Or do we approach our fellows with holiness and love? Let's think about a few of these in a little bit more detail. Adultery, wickedness, deceit, theft, murder. These are all um, sins grounded in selfishness grounded in selfishness. Adultery is a disregarding of a commitment made to another person. Theft is disregarding the property of another person. Slander is disregarding the dignity of another person. All of these are how we look to and treat other people. Do we treat them with respect? Do we treat them with dignity? Do we honor our commitments to them? Do we honor their commitments to other people? These are the questions that Jesus wants us asking. Fornication and licentiousness, a lot of debate around these words. But if you think about that, it's objectifying another person by their body, by their sexual identity rather than by their personhood. It's reducing someone's personhood. Each one of these items has to do with the way that we look at, regard, and engage with other people. Are we honoring the, the dignity of another person, the commitments of another person, the property of another person? Or are we thinking only of ourselves? I want that. I want to feel good. I want to disregard you. The Christian faith calls us to selflessness. The Christian faith calls us to overcome self. The Christian faith is not worried so much about what we eat as it is about what we do. This is a major pivot for our understanding of the faith and it comes here in Mark chapter seven. Jesus says in 723, the things that defile come from within. Jesus says in 723, all these things come from within and all these things defile. It was nice of Sarah to leave me the adultery, fornication, licentiousness, envy, malice, wickedness uh, section. She could have gotten that handled, but she wanted for me. And we'll, we'll, I'll send her a thank you note for that. Let's pick up a little bit in um, 7 and 24. We'll take another little bite. From there, Jesus sent out, set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him 
and she came and she bowed at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and feed it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Interesting story, famous story, wonderful story. Jesus sets out from where he is, and I've sort of lost track. I think he's at Bethsaida, if I'm not mistaken. And he goes to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre is not, um, uh, I don't know what the religion is in Tyre. It may, be, um, it may be a Gentile place, but I'm not entirely certain of that. Um, but it's not where he's been calling his disciples. It's not in Capernaum, it's not in Bethsaida, it's to a different place where he's less familiar. He tried to just go and take a day off, but he couldn't escape notice, and so this woman comes to him. Now, the woman is identified as a Gentile, so uh, regardless of what the community is in Tyre and its neighboring village of Sidon, um, we have a woman who has come who is not part of the flock. She's not Jewish. So all the folks who think that Jesus has come simply for the Jews are expecting him to send this woman away. And he does. He says in 27, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Let's, let's receive that metaphorically. Let the Jews be fed first. Let the children of God get this message before I come and speak to you Gentiles because it's not fair to take away what God sent for them and give it to you. Now that's pretty harsh. Those are not words that we expect to hear from Jesus, but they don't, the, the, um, but they don't stand very long. The woman says, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Now what an interesting tactic that is. Jesus says, you dog, get out of here. And she said, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs. She answers him with a logic. Uh, she, her response is a logic-based response. After we've just had this 23-verse dissertation between the Pharisees and Jesus, between the lawyers and Jesus, here we are in another village, and the wrong kind of person is asking a, a legalist question. But look also at the approach the Pharisees, the ones who are supposed to know who Jesus is, who are supposed to understand the Messiah, who are supposed to be the first ones to see the Messiah, they're there asking Jesus the wrong questions. Your people aren't washing their hands. Your people are eating the wrong things. And this woman, this wrong woman, this person who is not supposed to be among the first to know who Jesus is, she comes and says, and she, and she begs him to cast out the demon. She comes and says, I know who you are. Cast out the demon. It's, Mark is being very strategic by putting these two people, these two stories together. The right people are asking the wrong question in the first part of the chapter, and the wrong person is asking the right question in the second part of the chapter, and she's doing it in the same way that the first people did. And Jesus' response is, Jesus's response is totally different. To the Pharisees, he slaps them down and uses them as a teaching moment with his disciples. With the Syrophoenician woman, he heals her daughter and casts out the demon. This story is referenced in the prayer book. For those of you who... Uh, have been Episcopalians a long time, you'll remember uh, the prayer of humble access, which uh, in uh, previous issues of the prayer book was recited just before people received communion. 
Um, currently, it's preserved in our Write One office, which is the office we use at um, 8 o'clock service in the morning, back in normal times when we gathered in the church building. And I'd like to read this um, prayer because you will hear in it the echoes of the story of the Syrophoenician woman. Remember, this prayer comes at the very end of um, the celebration of the Eucharist and just before the people of God receive communion. And the prayer is this. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Bonus points to anyone whose lips just started reciting that with me as I started to read. It's very, very familiar and much loved. Modern theologians would challenge the prayer, which is why it doesn't appear in the Rite to office, uh, the Rite to version of the Holy Eucharist. They would challenge the prayer by saying, we are not dogs under Jesus's table. We are the beloved children of God, children by adoption. This coming, this coming uh, Sunday, we hear that wonderful reading from Romans 8, uh, where it says, we are children by adoption, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and all things in Christ. Beautiful language. But more contemporary theologians might say, we're not dogs gathering up crumbs under Jesus' table. We are the beloved children of God. I respect that position. I think the prayer is beautiful for what it is, which is a reference back to the Syrophoenician woman who says, Lord, I know that I'm outside the community. Lord, I know that all these Jews around here would look at me as a dog, but even the dogs get to eat the scraps. Please, please help my daughter. And Jesus says, your faith has made your daughter well. And she goes home and finds that the demon has been taken out of her daughter. And listen to the language of the prayer. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but the prayer doesn't leave us there. We are not worthy, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy whose property is always to have mercy. In the story of the Syrophoenician woman, where we get this language, Jesus has mercy. For each one of us, Jesus has mercy. We are of ourselves not worthy to sit at the table of God. But the beautiful promise of our faith is that we are invited there anyway. All of those parables about the bridesmaids and the, the wedding banquet, all of that is designed to say that we are invited to God's table, not because we deserve to be there, but because the king himself has invited us to be there. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Let's see if I can quickly find that prayer and put it in the comments field. It's a good one to keep around. I put the text in the comments field. It's also on Book of Common Prayer, page 337, if anyone would like to read. Oh, Linda Christopher, getting ahead of me. That's great. Actually, I'm realizing that the version I put up is not the current version. So Book of Common Prayer, page 337 is where you can find that prayer. Um, Kate Church asks, did the Pharisees continue as such, or did they finally come around? And I think we're going to need to discover that as we get towards the end of the gospel. Um, to a certain extent, some of them, I think, came around. In John's gospel, we had Nicodemus who came around. 
Um, we have Paul, who was a Pharisee, and he certainly came around. But we also have the Pharisees and the scribes conspiring with the high priests to um, hand Jesus over for crucifixion. So I think my answer to your question, Kate, is whether they come around, the answer is some do, some don't. And as we get towards the end of St. Mark's Gospel, we're going to want to take a look at that and see how, um, uh, see how the Pharisees are portrayed, how the temple leaders of the day are portrayed. I'm going to pause for just a second and get that prayer. It's a beautiful one, and I want to make sure I give you the right um, citation. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Let's read just a little bit more. Chapter 7 and verse 31. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee. So what we have is the Sea of Galilee, little lake up at the top of what we now know today as Israel. And around it are a number of communities. Bethsaida and Capernaum are right on the lake. And uh, Tyre and Sidon are a little bit away from the lake, but still up in that same region. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre, going by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Again, we're putting a very precise, uh, Mark puts a very precise location on this. Um, we see in, let's get my Gospels mixed up. Um, We see in St. Luke's Gospel a time precision. So when uh, Luke says in Luke chapter 2 that the census which drove Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem was being taken in the reign of Quirinius, um, when Quirinius was the governor of, uh, of Syria, Syria, in any case, when, during the reign of Quirinius, um, Luke is putting us in a very specific time. This actually happened at this exact time. Mark here is putting us in an exact geographical location. He's going to a great deal of trouble to tell us um, uh, what town Jesus is in, what town Jesus is passing through, what towns are nearby. You also notice Decapolis, uh, the roots of that are Greek, Deca and Polis, 10 cities. Um, he's telling us that that's a region of the Gentiles. So it's not a Jewish place, it's a Greek speaking place. It's a Gentile place. They brought, this is uh, 732, they brought Jesus a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Then he took him aside in private, away from the crowd, put his fingers in his ears, and spat, and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, which is, be open. And immediately his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Now, let's set aside again uh, the practices of spitting and putting saliva on people, people's tongues. This is not something that we would do during the COVID-19 pandemic, but back in Jesus' time, that was not, um, they were not worried about such things. Jesus goes away, he pulls him aside in private. He spits, 
he touches his tongue in some way mimicking Jesus's tongue, Jesus's saliva, this young man's tongue and saliva. There's a, um, a healthy tongue and in pet, um, there's a healthy tongue, there's a stopped tongue, a uh, lot of comparison going on. And he says, Ephatha, which is be opened. And immediately, this is Mark, remember, immediately, everything happens right away now. Immediately, his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone. Remember, this is Mark again. We have the Markan messianic secret. Jesus doesn't want the word to spread too quickly. He wants to have some time to be able to teach and preach and call people to his service. Please don't tell anyone. The crowds are already pressing in on me such that I had to get into a boat to do my teaching. Please don't tell anyone. I'm just here to help you. But people just can't stop. A deaf man has been healed. New life is being given. Miracles are being performed. Demons are being cast out. I'd have a hard time keeping the secret myself. Jesus asks for the secret, but his people just can't do it. And that's such a model for us. If our hearts are really transformed by this Jesus person whom we claim to follow, if we really have been turned away from the world and towards the cross of Christ, how is it that we could ever keep that to ourselves? If you're able to hold back the joy that you have in Christ, I would say to you that there is a deeper well from which you can draw. Jesus is inviting you to more. If your faith is not overwhelming your heart such that you couldn't possibly hold it in, there's a deeper level to which you can go. Hear this as invitation, not as guilt, not as you've not done something right or you've not experienced something fully, but as Jesus saying to you, there's more. Because this faith was so convicting to the original disciples that they couldn't hold it in. This understanding of church that we have these days of being apart and physically distanced and all of that is... Um, is new in the Christian community, but the idea of being separated is not. Remember, Christianity is still illegal in the empire. And so these people are taking their life in their hands by saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, or I believe that Jesus just cast out this demon or performed this miracle or healing or cured the deaf man. Note that Jesus did more than he was asked. He was asked to loosen his tongue and he went and cured the deafness too. Someone who believes that, someone who is convicted of that truth, is taking his life in his hands when he goes and tells people, but these people can't hold it in. If we can hold it in, it means there's another level for us, a deeper level, an invitation that God is extending to us. The disciples in 737 were astounded beyond measure. And they said, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Thanks be to God for that. Let's take a look at uh, the beginning of chapter 8. We have a few more minutes. Chapter 8 and verse 1. In those days, when there was again a crowd without anything to eat, he called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. The disciples replied, How can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few small fish, 
And after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. And they ate and they were filled. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Now there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Delamutha. Now, you're probably saying, that sounds familiar, not just because it's a famous story, but I thought we'd heard that recently. And we did. If you will look back in your text to chapter 6 and verse 34, you'll find that this is the second feeding parable or feeding story in three chapters. Chapter 6, verse 34, Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is very late. Send them away so that they can go and buy something for themselves. And, they, and Jesus said, you give them something. And they said, you want us to give them something? 200 denarii wouldn't give them enough to eat. And Jesus said, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And they found that they had five and two fish. And he ordered the people to sit down on the green grass, another detail, on the green grass, and divided the fish and the bread among them. And they ate and they were filled and they took up 12 baskets of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. So in chapter six, we're feeding 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish, and we have 12 baskets full at the end. Here in chapter eight, we have seven loaves and an undisclosed number of small fish, small fish, Mark says, and we distribute them and we have seven baskets left over after feeding 4,000 people. Fish sandwiches indeed, uh, Robert Kyle, indeed, Jesus's favorite recipe. Linda points out the significance of the number. Seven is a very important, perfect biblical number, as is 12. In chapter six, we have 12 baskets left over. In chapter eight, we have seven baskets left over. There's a perfection there, a completion there. We have a total of 9,000 people having been fed in uh, this period of time. But let's remember again that, John, that Mark is the efficient gospel writer. Mark keeps things moving. I just pointed out that the, uh, uh, the uh, Jesus' birth, uh, adolescence coming on the scene, baptism and calling disciples took less than 25 verses. Here we have a story being repeated twice. Why is Mark spending his few minutes and his few words by duplicating a story? Well, the answer is he wants it to underscore it. He wants to make sure we're paying attention. What is the premise of the story? The premise is God's abundant love for his people. There are all of these people around and they don't have, an, they don't have what they need to be sustained. Give it to them. Let's take the bread as a metaphor at the moment for spiritual nourishment. We have all these hungry people, 9,000 hungry people. And Jesus' disciples want to send them home to figure out on their own where they're going to eat, where they're going to find nourishment. But Jesus says to them, no, you give it to them. You, you give them something to eat, something to nourish their spirits. And in case you missed it the first time, I'm going to tell it to you again. Keep feeding the people. Feed my sheep, as Jesus will say in John. Chapter 8 and verse 11, the Pharisees come back. Jesus has just fed 4,000 people and the Pharisees come up to him and they begin to argue. That's what Pharisees do, particularly when they're on the road. Remember, they're from Jerusalem. The Pharisees ask him for a sign from heaven to test him. I wonder if they had a fish sandwich in their hand while they were asking for that. Uh, Jesus, could you give us a sign? You want a sign? I just fed 4,000 people with six loaves of bread. 
with five loaves of bread and I've got seven baskets left over. That's going to be your sign for today, friends. I hope you're enjoying your meal. Jesus, give us a sign. And Jesus looks and he says in verse 12, why does this generation just keep asking me for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them. And getting in the boat, he went across to the other side. It's not true that no sign was going to be given to this generation. What is true is that no sign was going to be seen by this generation. Because if Jesus is able to um, heal the blind, and if Jesus is able to cast out demons, and if Jesus is able to multiply all this food and feed all these people uh, literally, and then also metaphorically to feed them spiritually, uh, that's, that's all the sign that you're going to get. And if that's not enough sign for you, there's nothing I'm going to be able to do. This is the sign. Linda asks how they were able to wash their hands first, and I don't, before they ate, and I don't know, but I bet they did. Um, these are in the days before hand sanitizer, uh, but I bet they did. Isn't it interesting also the bread metaphors? So we have bread, literal, in chapter 6 with the feeding of the 5,000. We have bread, literal, in um, chapter 8 um, with the feeding of the 4,000. And then in the middle, uh, at the beginning of our study, uh, Sarah gave us the image of a Markin sandwich, which I think uh, works especially well in bread metaphors. In between the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark 8 and the feeding, Mark 6, and the feeding of the 4,000 in Mark 8, we get the story of the Syrophoenician woman who's coming asking for crumbs of bread. Everybody gets bread in this section of Mark's gospel. There's enough for everyone. There's enough for the people who are gathered seeking inspiration. There's enough for the Pharisees. There's enough for the Jews. There's enough for the Gentiles. There's bread for everyone. We're eating and we're being nourished and we're being sustained in this part of the gospel. Let's take one more bite. Ah, ha, ha, one more bite. Uh, let's take one more bite um, because it's uh, Jesus continues uh, this bread uh, metaphor, or the bread imagery in chapter 8 and verse 14. So we finished the feeding of the 4,000. We've gotten back into the boat and we're going across. And then, bump, bump, bum, chapter 8 and verse 14, on the boat, the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus just has to start shaking his head. I've just fed 9,000 people with the bread that you brought with you, and now we're here in the boat and you didn't even pack a lunch? Come on now. Pharisees, the disciples, had forgotten to bring any bread. They had only one loaf with them in the boat. And Jesus cautioned them, saying, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They said to one another, it's because we have no bread. And because Jesus, and becoming aware of it, Jesus said, what are you talking about not having any bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts still hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? Blind man, deaf man. Do you, are, are you blind? Are you deaf? Do I need to heal you to get this point across? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? 12, they said, and seven for the 4,000. How many baskets of broken pieces did you collect there? And they said to him, seven. And then he said to him, do you not yet understand? Do you not understand what I'm doing? I don't want to go in the direction of saying that this is a metaphor. I, I want to take the miracles in the Bible completely at face value. I don't want to persuade us out of it by saying, well, maybe they had pieces and this is a story about sharing and all of that. Let's just take the scripture at face value. Jesus multiplied the bread so as to say there is enough food for everyone. I will multiply literal bread today, and I will multiply metaphorical bread tomorrow, and I will fill your souls. I am the living bread. It's 
Jesus says in St. John's Gospel, those who eat of this bread will never die. But the disciples just don't get it, and Jesus calls them out. I've just fed 9,000 people with loaves, and y'all didn't bring any bread with you except one loaf, and you're wondering how we're going to make that go for 13 of us. I've just fed 9,000 people with less than a dozen loaves. And you wonder how we're gonna take care of 12 of us, 13 of us here on the boat with the one that's in your, sandwich, in your sack. You just don't get it. With me, there is always going to be enough food. There's always going to be enough sustenance. You just don't get it. I hope that we do. In the service of God, there will always be provision enough. There will always be food enough. Just as God provided manna in the wilderness for the Israelites, Jesus provides bread on the side of the Sea of Galilee. Just as Jesus provides bread on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus provides inspiration and metaphorical bread for the Syrophoenician woman. And in the same way, God provides spiritual nourishment to us. Always enough to go around, even in the midst of a global pandemic. It's a wonderful section of the gospel and a reminder that we will always have enough and that God's storehouse will never run dry. The next section of chapter eight has a significant pivot to it. So I think I'm gonna stop us here with this lengthy discourse on bread and crumbs and inspiration and healing. I'm so glad to be back with you. And I'll be back with you again next Thursday as we pick up at uh, Mark chapter eight and verse 22 uh, and carrying forward. I love you all very, very much. Stay home and stay safe, wash your hands a lot and know that you uh, that I love you and that I'm looking forward to seeing you again when it's safe to do so. Church services on Sunday are live stream at 8 and 10.30. Uh, if you're comfortable coming in person, you can do so at 9 indoors or at 5.30 in the afternoon outdoors. If you come for the outdoor service, please bring your own chair. Um, if you come for the indoor service, please make sure to wear your mask uh, and follow the instructions of the worship hosts. Outdoor worship, uh, wear your mask when you come as well. I love you. May God bless you and I'll see you back next week. Take care, bye-bye.